Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God. And we're going to do another sermon in our series on our uh, latest draft book uh, about the Lost Tribes. We spoke about promises of royalty and the, uh, the royal line continuing past uh, Zedekiah, who was the last king of uh, Judah. Uh, and he was the last one on the throne of David to reign in Jerusalem. So we're going to go over some things, including uh, lists of uh, kings uh, from David's time to present. But let's go get some scriptural background. I'm going to read a couple of verses, uh, several verses actually. I'm going to start with 1 Kings 2.45. You don't have to go there, but this is from the uh, New King James. It says, King Solomon shall be blessed, and Solomon was David's son. And the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. And we're going to go to Jeremiah. Uh, I'm going to read a couple passages in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 22, verse 2, and then Jeremiah 33. In Jeremiah 22, cutting into verse 2, we read, Hear the word of the Lord, O King of Judah, you who sit on the throne of David. So in Jeremiah's time, people were sitting on the throne of David. It was still called the throne of David. And uh, so people wonder, was that the throne of David? Yes, it was talking about the throne of David here. And, uh, and your servants, the people who enter the gates. Now, in Jeremiah 33, Jeremiah writes, For thus says the Lord, uh, starting in verse 17, Jeremiah 33, beginning of verse 17. David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Now, wait a second. Jeremiah is saying this, but the last king gets knocked out. He's gone, Zedekiah, in Jeremiah's time. Did God make a mistake? Of course God didn't make a mistake. But if you look at many, what many people in the world believe, yeah, they think God made a mistake because there was no more king. And uh, until Jesus came, and it's like, no, look it. Thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Uh, and so what we see there is that God, through Jeremiah, was telling us, look, Zedekiah is not the last guy. Now, Zedekiah was the last king when Jeremiah was alive. He was the last king in Israel. Oh, well, actually, he was, in, yeah, he was in Jerusalem, Judea. But that was, that was supposed to be it. Now, the passages say this. And, you know, Jesus said in John 10, 35, that Scripture can't be broken. So, therefore, somebody had to be on this throne after Zedekiah was gone. And so, where? And who? And that's some of the things we're going to cover in this sermon. We're also going to cover some things about Samaria, some prophecies we had in the United States, etc. as well. We've got a lot I want to actually uh, cover here. Now, in Genesis 49, verse 10, and I've read this a couple other times recently, it says that the scepter, the royalty, will not depart from Judah. Now, Judah was one of the 12 sons of uh, Jacob Israel, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. So we, the scepter came to David of Judah. He became king. You read about this in Numbers 24, 17, and 2 Samuel 8, 2. Now, some, particularly on the Protestant side, have said, till Shiloh comes, that means Jesus is first coming. But there's two problems. First of all, then who are the kings between Zedekiah and Jesus? And secondly, when Jesus was around, in John 18, 36, he said his kingdom was for the future. He didn't assume the throne there. So, uh, Genesis 49.10 has to be a reference to Jesus' second coming. Why? For another reason, we did not see the obedience of the people given to Jesus during his first coming. Matter of fact, not only did they not want to obey Jesus, they got together to get him killed. So biblically, take all that into account, we know there's got to be some kind of royal succession from Judah's line, the throne of David, until Jesus returns. So somebody had to be there. And again, 
God inspired Jeremiah to write this when Zedekiah was the last king. So God's not stupid. God knows everything. He wouldn't have that in there. And I think one of the reasons why God had that in Jeremiah was specifically to tell us just because Zedekiah was gone, there are other kings, there's a royal line. Okay, now back in the 19th century, an Anglican scholar and uh, minister put together a list of monarchs of Judah all the way through Queen Victoria, because she was queen at the time. And as far as the dates that it goes, there's various, one of the problems you have when you look in ancient literature is trying to figure out dates because there's contradictions in some parts and other parts and it makes it a bit tricky. So for pretty much things before the 5th century AD, uh, things are really tentative. So I've got a list here. I'm going to hold this up for just a moment. You can see this. First part of this list comes from people in the Bible. We see King David followed by King Solomon, followed by Rehoboam. Uh, then we've got, uh, what's this guy, I can't see. Abijim, then King Asa, uh, Josephat, etc. All the way down. I don't, I don't have them all memorized. <laughs> Azaziah, Joash, Amaziah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, uh, Ammon, Josiah, and finally, Zedekiah. Okay? So those are all in the Bible. You can read about those people in uh, 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 well, Kings and Chronicles. And so, that being said, wait a second, what happened to Zedekiah? Zedekiah's eyes were put out, he was put to death, he died, he was, was gone, they got put to death him and his, his sons, so it's all over, right? No. I want to go to Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 21. And I'm going to read this from the old King James Version of the Bible. You see, because it sounds kind of like well, if Zedekiah is gone, his sons are gone, okay, it's all, it's all over. Uh, you know, where did the crown, somebody took the crown and went somewhere. And that's what we read about Ezekiel chapter 21, starting verse 26. So thus says the Lord God, remove the diadem, which is a symbol of royalty, and take off the crown. Okay, well, that was removed from Zedekiah. It was taken off. This shall not be the same. Okay, so Zedekiah was not replaced the way people normally would think. Exalt him that is low, and abase him that is high. Well, the high one was Zedekiah and his sons, and they were abased. Verse 27, God prophesies through Ezekiel the prophet, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. He's going to overturn it. What? The crown. He's going to overturn it. Three times it says that. And it shall be no more till he comes to whose right it is, and I will give it to him. Now, whose right is it? Well, we've covered some of this before in a, a previous sermon. And again, all this stuff is also in uh, this free book. It's free online at ccog.org. Uh, this book and any other book or book that I hold up uh, today, unless I say otherwise, is available free. You go to ccog.org, click on the literature tab, and it'll bring the front covers up of all our different books and booklets, and you can click on them and read them. We don't ask you for your email. You can read it privately, study them, check it out, what we say with your Bible. You can check out historical references as well. Anyway, we mentioned before that the Bible says that Jeremiah traveled with the, queen's, the king's daughters. And as far as we can tell, one of the daughters was named Tia Tefe. And according to what's considered to be legends, but ancient historical accounts, uh, Jeremiah took Tia Tefe into Ireland. Ireland? Yes, Ireland. 
My wife and I were in Ireland in May of this year. We were at three places that the Irish claimed Jeremiah was. There was a fourth place we didn't get to. Now, some discount the idea that Jeremiah could have been there. Uh, we have some information about that also in the, in the book that I, I mentioned. But when Tia Tefi got there, uh, she, according to what we know of, she married somebody named uh, Hurriman. Now, Hurriman was, from what we can tell, a, also a descendant of Judah. Judah had uh, uh, twins by, by uh, uh, a woman who had been his, actually his daughter-in-law. And if you read the account in Genesis, one of the twins, twin by the name of Zerah, before he was born, stuck his hand out, and the uh, midwife said, ah, he was born first, this one was born first, and put a red uh, thread on his finger or his hand. And then his brother, uh, Pharaoh, came out. And when you look at the throne of David, David came from the Pharaoh's line. And yet, we, Zerah was the firstborn. As the firstborn, he would be the one that has the right of the firstborn, and the way it generally worked for kings, most of the time, is the firstborn son would be king. Well, anyway, after Harriman, who seems to be a descendant of Zerah, married Tiatefi, he healed the breach between both houses, and he was now the ruler of the line of Judah, of the, the throne of David. And so he's in Ireland. So we mentioned overturn. So this is the first overturning. This is overturning from King Zedekiah, who was originally in uh, uh, Jerusalem, last, last king in Jerusalem, to, to Ireland. Now, we've got a long list. I'm not going to try to read uh, all these words for a couple of different reasons. One is I will really destroy uh, the, the uh, Gaelic translation. But we have Haramon, who... Uh, uh, looks like he was replaced by King Ariel Fahid, and there's a whole list of these people and dates. Again, this is a list that Frederick Glover had put together and actually sent to the Queen of England at the time, Queen Victoria. Uh, he actually sent this to her, and there's a there's a whole list of different ones, and you can see the list continues on. The whole list. So I'm, since I'm not going to read the entire list, list, the whole list actually is in this free book. So you can see this. Now, we don't know if every name is perfectly correct, but basically, uh, Frederick Glover believed he put together a list of everyone from the throne of, the throne of David, from King David up until uh, Queen Victoria. Now, there's another end. And this is, gets tricky, because I, I did some additional research beyond what uh, Glover had done, because I tried to look at some of these things. And the last one was somebody called, we think perhaps called Urk or Fulgon, who uh, was uh, had, with a princess named Uriah. Now, Glover thought the king was Uriah, but it seems like Uriah was a female, but we're not sure. So I did some additional research, and one statement I found was the ruler most close dated with the dynastic transfer from Northern Ireland to Western Scotland is Fergus Moore, son of Irk. Okay, so we have this Irk as the last uh, king in Ireland, and he went over to Western Scotland. So he's in Northern Ireland, went to Western Scotland. Um, shouldn't use my hand as a double map, but I, I will. Um, you've got... Uh, uh, Northern Ireland and over here uh, Western Scotland so they kind of tie, tie up tie together I should have looked up how far it is but it's not ridiculously far so Fergus Moore was next on Glover's list and this happened in uh, looks like uh, the 5th century AD toward the end of it as a time frame that we were looking at this of occurring and Fergus Moore was replaced by some people whose names are easier for me to say. Uh, king uh, Dongard, then King Conran, then King Aidan, then uh, Eugene IV, then Donald IV, then another Dongard, then Eugene V, 
then Fiden, then Eugene the seventh. So I don't have the Eugene the sixth in this list. And um, so that was the second overturning when it went when Fergus Moore went from Ireland into Scotland. And they were relatives they had on both sides. So this is one of the reasons why they made the switch. But he switched over. So that was another overturning. So we went from, again, the original throne of David in Jerusalem to Ireland, Northern Ireland, then came over to Scotland. So that's the, the, uh, the second overturning. And then uh, there are other kings of Scotland, Kenneth II, Constantine II, Donald VI, Malcolm I, Kenneth III, etc., etc. I'm not going to go through the entire list again because you can find this, see the list right in here. Uh, there was a King Robert the uh, First, and there was a Robert the Second and Third. Then there was a King James the First. Um, don't know what happened to James the Second. He's not on the list. But then the James the Third is. Then James the Fourth is. James the Fifth. Then there's King James the Sixth. Now he's an interesting one because this will be the third overturning. So he was a sovereign in Scotland, but a lot of royal families uh, intermarried, and it turns out uh, Queen uh, it was Queen Elizabeth uh, didn't have any male heirs, and it turns out that King James the Sixth of Scotland was the next person in line. Uh, I'm not an expert on how they determine who's in what order, but I know that with the current British royal family, there's an order. This person is next, following this one, blah 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 blah. Matter of fact. Now, Queen Elizabeth II wasn't supposed to be <laughs> the one who was supposed to be the uh, the, the royal the, have, have take, get the crown, but she ended up getting it because of how the succession list works uh, based on who's available and who's not available, who will do it and who won't do it. But anyway, so somewhere around 1603, this is believed, uh, King James VI uh, came down to, uh, to England. So that's the third overturning. So remember, Ezekiel said, overturn, overturn, overturn. So that happened three times. And he was married to Anne of Denmark. So again, there's some uh, crossovers with royal families along the line. And there you, eventually we've had uh, uh, King George, uh, King George the, the, the third, starting from uh, 1760 to 1820. He was the one during the uh, U.S. Uh, the American Revolution. Uh, then we end up getting Queen Victoria. Uh, she was crowned, uh, looks like in 1838, and uh, she was married to Prince Albert. Uh, she was replaced. So that's where uh, Frederick Glover's list ended. So from then on, I added the rest. Uh, King Edward VII uh, replaced uh, queen Victoria, and she was her, his queen was actually Alexandra of Denmark. <laughs> we had other some more Danes involved here. Then it was George V, then uh, King Edward VIII, then King George VI, and Queen Elizabeth II, who died this year, replaced by her son King Charles III. And so there has been a royal succession line, and we don't see a line like this in Africa or Asia. Or Latin America. As far as uh, King George the Sixth, not King George the Sixth. I'm sorry. King James the the Sixth. Uh, he was credited for combining the English and Scottish crown into one. And here's something that I found posted by the Parliament of the United Kingdom. Until the early 17th century, England and Scotland were two entirely independent kingdoms. This changed dramatically in 1603 at the death of Elizabeth I of England. Because the queen had died unmarried and childless, the English crown passed to the next available heir. Her cousin, King James VI of Scotland. In 1606, he gave orders for a British flag to be created, which bore the combined crosses of St. George and St. Andrew. The result was a Union Jack, Jack being a shortening of 
Jacobus, the Latin version of James, uh, or, or which actually originally would be Jacob, uh, the, the progenitors of uh, sons of Israel, tribes of Israel. Anyway, so we see that there were some blood relations between the Scottish and English uh, monarchs and that they blended. Now in 1957, the late uh, Radio Church of God evangelist Dr. Herman Hay uh, wrote about the British Commonwealth nations being uh, Ephraim. And it turns out that the United Kingdom, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, all except the British sovereign, as do another dozen of mainly island nations who are part of the Commonwealth. And there's also other countries, by the way, who are in the Commonwealth. It's no longer called the British Commonwealth like it was before. And uh, although they don't officially accept the British throne, they do to a somewhat of a, de a degree because who's the head of the Commonwealth? King Charles III. You know, in Jeremiah 31, verse 9, God declared Ephraim as his firstborn. Perhaps that's another reason why God had that inspired in the book of Jeremiah, to let him know the Ephraimites, the land of the Ephraimites, is going to be involved with, this, with the scepter of promises. And the primary uh, Ephraimite nations right now, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, I miss one? I hope I didn't miss one. Uh, all are under the throne of David. Now, as sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh are brothers. Joseph was one of the uh, 12 sons of Israel. He had uh, two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, as we read before, in not in this sermon, but previous ones, in Genesis chapter 48, Israel adopted Ephraim and Manasseh as his own. And again, they were brothers. And even though that the current royal family doesn't publicly embrace the fact that Ephraim represents the British descended peoples, even though Prince Charles told somebody I knew that he did believe in this, that he wouldn't say it publicly, we still actually see aspects of the special relationship between the United States uh, along with uh, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the United Kingdom. In 1941, something called the Five Eyes Alliance was officially formed. Basically, these nations treat each other as trusted friends and no one else. And who does that include? The United States, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. And the Five Eyes Alliance still exists to this day. Now, back in 1946, uh, Britain's Win uh, Winston Churchill spoke of the, quote, the fraternal association of the English-speaking peoples. And he meant uh, a special relationship between the then British Commonwealth and Empire and the United States. And in 2011, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau actually referred to the USA and Canada as siblings, like brothers. And literally, Ephraim and Hesse were brothers. Now, there was a new alliance that formed in uh, the year 2021. So last year, Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States announced a new military alliance called AUKUS. Now, there are already in other military alliances, but they have put it together, together, but they put another one together. And this uh, offended the Chinese as well as officials in the, United, in the European Union who called it a stab in the back. And the reality is the United States, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, United Kingdom do have a special relationship and it is a biblically fraternal one. Now it wasn't until the 19th century that it became clear that Britain was a multitude of nations. Nor did the uh, United States truly look to be a great nation until sometime uh, that, that century. Uh, some, it looked a little bit before the Civil War, but because of the Civil War people thought the U.S. might fall apart. Now, I want to read something that a writer by the name of A.B. Robertson, who believed that Ephraim was England, reported about the expansion of the British Empire. But he wrote, Let us look further at the wide world scope of this colonization. It embraces four great groups, which already together dominate 
no inconsiderable share of the Earth's surface. First, the North American, second, the Australian, third, the West Indian, and fourth, the South African. He says, the following list shows, at a glance, the truth and importance of this 19th century expansion and the phenomenal increase of our population. So I'll hold up his list, but I'm going to read it uh, so you'll, you can better see it. Again, it is in this book, so you can find it in this book. Anyway, first thing he listed, he said Malta, was a, which is an island, was acquired by conquest in 1800. Tasmania, which is also an island, was organized in 1803. The Cape of Good Hope was taken from the Dutch in 1806. Ceylon, which is now called Sri Lanka, in 1815. Uh, in 1829, West Australia formed into a province. 1834, South Australia formed into a province. 1841, Hong Kong taken from the Chinese. Okay. 1841, New Zealand made a separate colony. 1849, the Punjab, region of India, formally annexed. 1850, Victoria formed in province, that would be, I think, Australia. 1852 to 1853, there was a second Burmese war, Pegu was annexed. 1856, Ode annexed. And so by 1858, India was transferred to the crown, all of India. So they got out these different pieces and ended up with it. 1859, Queensland, uh, which is in Australia, I've been there, uh, formed into a province. 1876, the queen publicly proclaimed as the Empress of India. 1878, Cyprus was taken possession of. 1883, New Guinea was annexed by Queensland. And in 1886, Upper uh, Burma was annexed. So there was a lot of expansion, territorial expansion, of the British Empire in the 19th century. So much so, it was said that the sun never set on uh, the British Empire. And it was the largest land empire the world's ever seen. Uh, I want to give, an, uh, as far as why did it go begin then, I want to read something else from the late uh, Dr. Herman Hay. Uh, he, he talked about this and referred to some promises in the book of Leviticus, chapter 26. So I will, I'll read what he wrote here. Some of what he wrote about it. And again, it's also in this book, available at ccog.org. Times of Israel punishment is a key to understanding. Israel was promised great national blessings, including national greatness, if they would obey God. But God also promised that if they obstinately refused to obey him, if they refused to follow his laws, let him rule over their lives, then he would punish them for a period called seven times, per Leviticus 26. The Bible itself defines this period of seven times for us. If you turn to Revelation, the 12th chapter, compare verses 6 to 14, you'll see the word time in prophecy simply means a year, hence seven times would be seven years, or 2,520 days. He says, now, notice another key in Numbers 14.34. God said Israel would bear their iniquities in the wilderness the number of days they searched the land of Canaan. Forty days, each day for a year. The seven times, or 2,520 prophetic days, would equal 2,520 prophetic years. This period of seven times, or 2,520 years, punishment, did come upon Israel because they went their own ways and would not submit to the rule of God. Israel went to captivity about 721 B.C. and didn't become a great people again until their times of punishment ceased around 1800 A.D. At that time, the descendants of the ancient house of Israel, America and Britain, and the democratic peoples of the world began to rise to such wealth and power the world has never enjoyed before because of all the promises made to Abraham. Now, somewhat on the same note, although the birthright was originally given to Jacob's oldest son, Reuben, I mean, he would have had it because he was firstborn, he lost it, and according to uh, 1 Chronicles uh, 5, 1 through 2, it went to Ephraim. And it comes to territory and wealth, Reuben, 
France, which we identified in previous one, previous messages, sold off a lot of its territory in the form of the Louisiana Purchase to the then rising United States of America back in 1803. From the 19th century to present, the United States and the United Kingdom have dominated the world. Now they're going to lose it in the 21st century, but they did receive the blessings that God promised them through Jacob. Now I was going to go to uh, Genesis 24, verse 60. It's a one short verse here. I mean, that's a normal size verse, I guess. Now this was something that was told to uh, uh, Isaac's wife, Rebecca. Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. Now, in the, the 19th and or 20th centuries, many of the sea gates of the world were possessed and or controlled by the United States, such as the Panama Canal, various locations, the Pacific Ocean, and the British uh, Empire, like the Straits of Malacca, Singapore, Suez Canal, uh, Babel Mandeb, Straits of Horez, Simonstown, Cape of Good Hope, uh, uh, Cyprus, actually, etc. And while that's no longer the case for many of them, the Bible, let's go to uh, Deuteronomy 28. I'm going to read several verses there, so why don't you go over there. It has a prophecy about losing possessions that are gained. In Deuteronomy 28, starting in verse 58, God warns, if you do not carefully observe all the words of this law which are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, and serious and prolonged sicknesses. And it shall be, verse 63, this is the Lord rejoiced over you to do good and multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice to destroy you and bring you to nothing, and you will be plucked off from the land which you go to possess. Now, certainly, the U.S. and its British-descended nations have disobeyed the God of Abraham. And I believe it's pretty clear that the remaining, some of the remaining sea gates of the United Kingdom, such as Gibraltar and the Falkland Islands, are going to be separated from uh, U.K. control. And as far as the United States goes, we've got various islands in the Pacific, including Hawaii, and those are, I think, going to go, too. Now, interestingly, partially related to the prophecy about Joseph's bow being strong, which you can read about in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verses 22 to 23, the Jews actually have a tradition that the descendants of Joseph would reign over the ten tribes, all the tribes of Israel, basically, in some kind of a military way. So let me read regarding that. Our sacred sages had a tradition in the beginning of the end times there would arise uh, an anointed savior or messiah from the house of Joseph who will reign over the ten tribes. He will wage war and all of Israel will be gathered under his banner. Now, it, again, this is a Jewish tradition. And while the United Kingdom and later United States didn't necessarily officially rule over all the ten tribes, uh, they did lead, and, and the Messiah didn't come from them, they did lead the Allied fight in uh, uh, World War I and World War II, and had support from pretty much all the tribes of Israel. And the USA and the UK have ruled over the North Atlantic Trade Organization, otherwise known as NATO, which basically directly includes the descendants of most of the tribes uh, of Israel. As a matter of fact, Probably all of them, because we've got, uh, I'm going to put, I wrote down most of my notes, uh, and I'm writing down possibly all, because the, as far as I know, the only two tribes that were not in NATO have applied to be in it. Uh, they, but when I checked this morning, uh, for example, uh, Finland's still not in it, but they are getting, very, they are waiting for approval, I guess, to be in it. So they've asked for protection. So they've been, they have, in a sense, ruled by the Anglo-American world order. 
Now, that being said, the Bible warns about trusting in Mount Samaria in the end times. You can read about that in Amos 6, verse 1. So, well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, prophetically, Samaria is the United States. And as it turns out, you know, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the UK do militarily trust in end times Samaria, the United States, so their uh, military protection, as do many others. Now, I want to read something from a, another Jewish source. The Malbum, now the Malbum is Miar Lebush Ben Yehiel Michel Wieser, interprets the blessings of Jacob in Genesis 48 that Ephraim would become great before Manasseh. Ephraim would become great through his own merits and self-assertion almost from the beginning. Manasseh would wait until the vast numbers of his population and weight of his blessing of itself would result in greatness. We identify Ephraim with the British and Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the whites of South Africa. The USA is Manasseh. The interpreta interpretation of the Malbum concerning Ephraim and Manasseh fits historic reality. Again, I'm reading this from a Jewish source. And Ephraim did arise first. Again, the British Empire is the largest land empire the world's ever seen and followed by Manasseh's rise in the United States. Now, as far as being helpful to understand end-time prophecy goes, Church of God leaders taught decades ago that the United Kingdom, for example, would not be part of the final European power. I want to read something that the late evangelist Raymond McNair wrote back in 1970. Britain, if she does enter the European economic community, and at the time Britain had not, but then it did, will she remain in the Union? Bible prophecy clearly shows that Britain will not be one of the nations comprising the final United States of Europe. So that's what he wrote. And I remember telling somebody about this back in the 1990s, the time I was vice president of an irrigation manufacturer, and we had a representative for Europe, our sales rep, uh, and he was actually lived in uh, the UK. And at the time, the European Union was called, well, what's now called the European Union, was called the European Economic Community. And I told this British rep, when he was visiting our factory in uh, California, that one day the United Kingdom was going to uh, leave and the time they were in there, and he said, no, it couldn't possibly happen. And he gave his reasons. But his reasons were not biblical ones. His reasons probably made a lot of sense to him, but they didn't align with the Bible. A lot of people discount the Bible or don't know what it teaches. He didn't think it was relevant. It's like, it's not possible. But he was in error. You know, with the Brexit, which is the British exit from the uh, uh, European Union re recently, our understanding that in the Church of God, a prophecy was correct. More prophetic understandings are going to be confirmed as well, including the fact that it says in Isaiah 17, verse 3, you don't have to go there, but it says in Isaiah 17, verse 3, fortress also will cease from Ephraim. The British said people are going to lose their military power. The Bible warns that the coming European beast will, in Daniel 8.25, quote, shall destroy many in their prosperity. And that's going to happen to the, the British and American peoples, British descendant American peoples. Now, as far as uh, Samaria goes, uh, some Christians have taught, quote, the people of the United States and Britain are actually descended from the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, which were part of the kingdom of Israel. The United States are often, and Britain are often referred to in biblical prophecy as the house of Israel, all Israel, Jacob, Ephraim, Samaria, and Isaac. And I'm trying to look for the reference. This came, came from, uh, I'm sorry, I got the, trying to get the correct reference from there. This actually comes from the uh, publication of the old Worldwide Church of God uh, from 1986. Anyway, as far as the USA goes, some people may wonder, hey, the United States is really ethnically diverse, so how can you say this is Manasseh, because uh, the son of Joseph? Well, by Jesus' time, there were people called Samaritans. 
They were only partially Israelites, even though they actually claimed to be from, from Joseph. And the Bible says or shows they were highly ethnically mixed. You can read about that in 2 Kings 17, verse 24. And apparently those in the Samaritan cities were, were not even considered Israelitish by Jesus. Uh, if you read Matthew 10.5. However, Peter, Philip, and John later did preach to people in the Samaritan city. Read that in Acts 8. Now, as it turns out, there are various prophecies related to Manasseh, but instead of calling Manasseh Manasseh, it calls Manasseh Samaria. Let's read some. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 9. I'll give you a moment to get there. Okay, Isaiah 9, we're going to start in verse 8. The, the Lord sent a word against Jacob, and it's fallen on Israel. Now in Genesis chapter 48, Jacob, whose name is also Israel, said, Let my name be on Ephraim and Manasseh. So we see this is a reference to them, but I'll prove it is in a second. Verse 9, All the people will know Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria. Okay, well, how does he prove that that's Manasseh? Well, if you go down to verse 21, it says, it talks about Manasseh shall devour Ephraim and Ephraim and Manasseh. Together they'll be against uh, Judah. And we also see something else on this line. You have to go there, but Hosea 7 verse 1 says, I would have healed Israel. Then the iniquity of Ephraim was uncovered and the wickedness of Samaria. So, we see in God's word, God combining... Ephraim and Samaria, and sometimes Ephraim and Manasseh, because Samaria is prophetic. Prophetic Samaria is the United States. Uh, so we see that Ephraim is not Samaria, by the way, because you can see that they're separate here. Uh, but that uh, Manasseh sometimes is. And there's other so there's some other scriptures along those lines as well. Now, in addition to uh, intermingling that occurred in ancient Samaria. Samaria was also part of the old territory of uh, Manasseh. Um, I should have got my reference up. I'm going to read this, re this from, a, from a reference here. The hill of Samaria was in the tribal territory of Manasseh. So ancient Manasseh, uh, let's see, probably pull it up from here. Okay. Um, you can see Manasseh over here. In ancient Manasseh, the hill of Samaria was in that territory. And it wasn't significantly inhabited until the time of King Omri, who was Ahab's father. For the next 160 years, the city was the capital of the northern kingdom, apparently reaching a size of 150 acres. About as large as uh, Jerusalem in Hezekiah's time. Samaria is well situated with steep slopes on all sides. And as far as scripture goes, I'm going to read 1 Kings 16, verses 23 and 24. So read about that to confirm this. Because we do believe the Bible, we base our beliefs on the Bible. 1 Kings 16, verse 23. Omri became king over Israel and reigned, reigned 12 years. Six years he reigned in Terza. And he bought the hill of Samaria from Shemar for two talents of silver. He built it on a hill. He called the name of the city which he built Samaria after the name of Shemar, the owner of the, owner of the hill. And another source says, Northern Samaria is often referred to by its biblical tribal designation, Manasseh. Now, Jewish scholars have also long recognized that the Samaritans were of mixed Israelite and non-Israelite heritage. Scripture shows that some of the poorer Israelites were allowed to remain as laborers and not be taken away by the Babylonians. We're not going to go there, but you can read this in 2 Kings uh, 25, verse 12. And again, anything I go over kind of quickly, almost all, most of the scriptures and the notes are are, are here. There's some things I do cover that aren't in the book, but most of them you can find if I'm looking at the references up later. And apparently they interbred with the people that the Assyrians brought there to their land, which you can read about in 2 Kings 17, 24. 
Now, scripturally, some have pointed to Second Chronicles 34.9 as a further proof that there were descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh that remained in Samaria. And there could be, and some could re, uh, turn there. Furthermore, the historian Herodotus reported that the Scythian armies entered Palestine in what's considered to be the Samaritan region. So some of them probably stayed, some probably uh, sired children, children while they were there. Now that said, in the 16th century, and yes, I know it's a lot of history, and I'm going to get to more prophecy in a few minutes, a Jewish sage by the name of Isaac Arbarbanel equated the prophecies of Samaria, Samaria with the tribes of Manasseh. Now I found that out recently. I figured this out uh, about 11, 12 years ago. Uh, but I found out later that oh, some others made the same connections that I was doing. Now it's interesting to note, while they're a mixture of people, uh, those who identify themselves as Samaritans have claimed to be from the tribe of uh, uh, Judah, of Joseph, I mean. And I actually I saw a documentary about the Samaritans, and that's what they still claim to this day. But there's an old Jewish uh, writing from like 1,500 years or so ago. It says, a rabbi, Mir, he asked the Samaritan, what tribe are you from? And the Samaritan says, from Joseph. And the rabbi says, no! But that's what they say. Now I want to read something else from a Jewish source related to Obadiah chapter 1, verse 19. It says, And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plain the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. Samaria means Manasseh, says that Sophrim, who according to the sage Rashi shall possess the Gilead. So anyway, there's different reasons, both from scripture as well as again Jewish tradition, which we don't rely on. But the Jewish tradition confirms what I've been saying for the long, for over a decade that Manasseh is prophetic Samaria. Now, by the way, the doctrinal person, one of the main doctrinal people I would consult with at my previous church organization, absolutely agreed with me. I was correct on this. Uh, as did, I think, their evangelist as well, but anyway, I don't know if they teach that. Uh, not clear. Now, I, not only did I see a documentary about uh, Samaritans, there's a place called the Israelite Samaritan Is Information Institute. In the 21st century, they say that, they, that the Samaritans are descendants of the houses of Manasseh and Ephraim. Others, however, believe the Samaritans have forgotten their true ancestry. Well, that said, well, what about the United States? Well, there is an ethnic diversity of the population in the United States. And the majority are not Manassites, probably, but that makes it consistent with Samaria, because they're all kind of mixed. Now, some have said Isaiah 9, verse 9 and 10, is a prophecy related to the terrorist attacks of 9-11-2001 in the United States. And it says, Isaiah 9, verse 9, All the people will know, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, who say in pride and arrogance of heart, The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we'll replace them with cedars. Now, many Protestant prophecy watchers have stated that this is related to what happened in the United States because of the September 11th attacks. Particularly since... Uh, we see that uh, the leaders of ancient Ephraim Manasseh declared they were going to rebuild. And we've seen that from the current President of the United States, the previous President of the United States, uh, the former Secretary of State of the United States, and a bunch of other officials have said that uh, we're going to rebuild. And uh, at least one Protestant source called those defiant statements, that uh, they're taking God out of the equation because they're just going to do it. And because there's a lot of prophecies regarding Samaria pointing to the United States, perhaps this is, is it seems consistent at least, with something that happened with uh, the September 11th attacks and statements made afterwards. Now, if you presuming that end time Samaria is Manasseh and Isaiah 9, 9 and 10 have end time fulfillment, 
And we've seen, again, many leaders in the United States who've, who've fulfilled this. Now I want to go to Hosea chapter 10. If this biblical prophecy has end time fulfillment, it seems to suggest that there will be a male leader who will be in charge when the United States falls. Hosea 10, uh, verse 7. As for Samaria, her king is cut off like a twig on the water. Also the high places of Aben and the sin of Israel shall be destroyed. The thorn and the thistles shall grow on their altars. They shall say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, fall on us. Verse 10. When it is my desire, I will chasten them. People shall be gathered against them when I bind them for their two transgressions. Now, if Hosea 10 has end time connections, and I, part of it seems to, particularly if you compare that to uh, Revelation 6.16, now, if we presume that the word translating king literally means a male, that would seem that the last President of the United States would be male. However, the fact that it says her king perhaps might speculatively allow for the final leader to be female. Now, in the Old King James translation in Isaiah 10 verses 5 through 11, it talks that God is going to use the Assyrians to go against a hypocritical nation. And we are getting close to the end of the 6,000 years God has given humankind to rule itself. And in the United States, we're seeing more and more hypocrisy. Uh, if you watch, watch U.S. news, which is really dominated by uh, political agendas and propaganda, you see hypocrisy. If somebody's guy or gal does something, it's okay, but not to the other side. Oh, it's the worst thing that could happen. If that person's side person does something and the other one jumps on it, it could be the same basic type of thing. Massive hypocrisy. Now I want to go to uh, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 30, starting verse 8. In the view of big tech and government censorships, as well as pushing certain agendas this century, consider what the Bible teaches, starting in verse 8 of Isaiah 30. Now go write it before them on a tablet, on a scroll, that it might be to come forever and ever. This is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things, speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceits. And that's what they want. It's interesting, back in October of 2022, I noticed that a video that we put up that I did on the 16th of November 2019 was removed. What was I talking about? I said that according to mainstream sources, there are uh, infections that can come up that we don't have treatments for. I said some bad things are going to happen. You can't put all your trust in vaccines because of vaccines people say things that aren't always accurate. And that was removed retroactively. I don't know when they removed it because they want to hear smooth things. They want to prophesy deceit. I referred to the Word of God, said what it prophesied, and that was true. And what I said in that particular video came to pass. Um, let's go down. Well, Isaiah 5, 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. They put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. They think those of us who believe in biblical morality, particularly on the sexual side, are horrible. And we should uh, keep our mouths shut. But in Isaiah 58, verse 1, it's, the Bible says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgression, and the house of Israel, the house of Jacob, their sins. And we've been edited and censored by, uh, by Vimeo and uh, oh, uh, YouTube for doing such things. <laughs> I did a video called Disney's Abominable uh, Promotions or something along that line. And that one, I think, within hours, YouTube totally, totally pulled that one out. Um, anyway, more and more people don't want to hear the truth of uh, the law of God or prophecies in His Word. Consider that some say that they're insulted if we call out their sins. 
and at least some associated with European and North American governments now want to make that a crime if they get insulted. You know, teaching truths about biblical prophecies, sometimes, by the way, for some of us, it's called conspiracy theories. But many nowadays only want to hear smooth things. Furthermore, various ones want to further stifle religious speech to the point of persecuting those who hold to aspects of biblical morality. The Bible in Romans 1 verse 18 warns about those who, quote, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, end quote. Many are fulfilling the prophecies in uh, uh, 2 Timothy 3. Uh, it's in the last days, men will be lovers themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, unholy, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, heady, headstrong, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. They have a form of godliness. They like to actually say, oh, religions believe this, but not the real religions believe their immorality. They're accepted. Uh, from such people, it says, turn away. These people are always learning and never coming to knowledge of the truth. Uh, we find the Bible warns in uh, Romans 1, they profess to be wise, but they become fools. And because of this, we see all these types of immorality. And you can read about uh, what God says about uh, the LGBTQ agenda in Romans 1, uh, verses 18 through 32. Now, let's go to uh, Ezekiel 36. Starting verse 22. It says, Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, but for my name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. Actually, one of the reasons why the U.S. and Russia split was because the United States insisted on the Russians uh, promoting LGBTQ things they wouldn't do. And they've done it to other nations, particularly throughout Africa as well. So I'm going to, because if you do this, I'm going to take you from among the nations, gather you out of the countries, bring you to your own land. Uh, time is going to come when they're going to know that I punished you. And let's say I should probably read that better than I've done. I will sanctify my great name, which you've profaned. And I'll, and I'll be held in your things, and I'll take you from among the nations. We're going to be made prisoners. One day God will take them away and clean, cleanse us, but it's, it's, going to, it's going to happen. Now, the Bible in Leviticus 26 says if we obey God, we have uh, weather blessings. And it says, starting verse 3, if you walk in my statutes, my commandments, and perform them, I'll give you rain in its season. The land will yield its produce. And the trees of the field will yield their fruit. Your threshing floor, your threshing will last till the time of the vintage, vintage till the time of sowing. You'll eat the full and dwell in your land safely. So what God's saying here is, look, if you do it my way, the weather will be the way it should be. You'll have plenty of food. You'll have more food than you need, and everything will be fine. But in Deuteronomy 28, you might want to go there. God says, what happens if you don't? It should come to pass if you don't obey, starting verse 15, Deuteronomy 28. If you don't obey the voice of the Lord your God, carefully observe all his commandments, these curses will overtake you. Verse 22, the Lord will strike you with fever, inflammation, severe burning fever, sword, scor scorching, uh, it's too hot, mildew, and you know, people will pursue you till you perish. And I'm going to uh, turn the, over your head, she'll be bronze, earth will be like iron, and God will change the rain of your land to powder and dust so you're destroyed. So there's all kinds of warnings about this. Um, I go through a bunch of other ones. For example, you don't have to go there, but Jeremiah 14 says about droughts. Uh, verse 7, your iniquities testify against you and your backslidings are many. In uh, Amos 4, why don't you go over there? We'll do that one. I'm going to skip over a lot of these prophecies, I think. But anyway, Amos 4, starting verse 6. It says, I gave you clean, cleanness of teeth in all your cities. Now, you might think that's a good thing. No, he means famine. Lack of bread in all your places, yet you haven't returned me, says the Lord. 
I withheld a rain from you. And from one city, one part was raining on, the other part it didn't. And they wandered together to get water, but you weren't satisfied, and yet you still haven't returned me. You didn't repent, says the Lord. Verse 9, I blast you with blight and mildew. And uh, then locusts came. You still haven't returned me, says the Lord. Verse 11, I overthrew some of you. You still didn't return to me. Verse 12, Therefore, this will I do to you, O of Israel, because of this, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Now, a lot of people think weather is totally random, but the Bible teaches God controls the weather. Psalm 148, verse 8. It sometimes provides extreme weather because of human sins. People talk about climate change, and the Bible has a solution to climate change. Uh, that the people ignore it and they think they've got a better way. And the Bible also, by the way, says that uh, droughts, etc., will hit end time European Babylon, in Jeremiah 50, verses 38 to 40. So don't think it's just the uh, British and descended, British and American peoples that are going to experience this. Uh, God uh, ties that in. As many of you know, I've been warning about uh, severe weather for a long time. Back in 2009, I had a book published where I said that we're going to have odd weather patterns. It's going to result in food shortages and natural disasters because the world's in a berserk transition. Uh, and it's a, we'll be entering the beginning of sorrows, uh, which we are now in. Furthermore, some other things have been going on. I want to go to the book of uh, Habakkuk. The Bible says that uh, debt from foreigners is a curse. Read about that in Deuteronomy uh, 28. But Habakkuk chapter 2, starting in verse 2, says, The Lord said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. Now this is a debt prophecy. And it's so significant, people should run. They should take steps, because it's so horrific. But most people, particularly the Laodiceans, don't think they need to take steps. They don't think it's this horrific. But they should pay attention. So let me read what God inspired Habakkuk to write 2,600 years ago, starting in verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but in the end it will speak, it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. So it says it's going to happen, it's going to be the end time, but it's going to seem like it takes a long time. But it's going to, it will end. Verse 5, talks about those who transgress by wine, being proud. Verse 6, Will not all these take up a proverb against him in a taunting riddle against him, saying, Woe to him who increases what is not his, how long, and to him who loathes himself with many pledges. This is talking about debt. This is Many pledges in modern times would be things like treasury bonds and treasury notes. Will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will not they awaken who oppress you? And will you you become their booty. Because you've plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you. Notice that this is so bad, people should run when it's time to be fulfilled. And it's to be fulfilled at the appointed time of the end. So despite the fact some, the Church of God, like in my prior organization, thinking it was fulfilled thousands of years ago, no. Furthermore, no nation's ever seemingly been as much debt as the United States of America whose official debt is over $31 trillion, plus there's unfunded liabilities, plus there's other state and local government debt, corporate debt, personal debt. And on a per capita basis, by the way, the United Kingdom and Canada are almost as bad. Uh, this is consistent with the understanding that the United States and its British descended allies are going to be hit with difficulties during the time of Jacob's trouble, which Jeremiah wrote about in Jeremiah 30, verse 7. The Bible also warns about silver becoming dross in the Bible uh, and says to reverse it if it happens, but that's not what happened. The United States uh, used to have silver coins, and now they became dross. They are no longer silver or any significant amount of silver. They're just not worth stuff. And by printing up treasury notes and money the way the U.S. Federal Reserve and the U.S. government has been, the Treasury has been doing, this is diluting the value of the money supply, which God says don't do. Furthermore, other secular sources say the United States is vulnerable to the loss of confidence by foreign creditors, and the U.S. government debt is extremely vulnerable to foreign attack because a high percentage of 
of foreign ownership. And China, by the way, who knows a lot of it, has said that uh, they call that their nuclear option if they ever want to dump the U.S. dollar. However, what's happened is uh, the United States is making itself even in a worse situation. Many have complained about the U.S. weaponizing its dollar through use of sanctions, banking restrictions, and other means. By doing so, the United States has actually set up a coalition to push aside its dollar, and that'll happen when they consider the timing is best. Now, European leaders have been working for years to establish a new reserve currency for the world, partially with the intent of pushing aside the U.S. dollar from its position as the world's primary reserve currency. Now, by the way, the fact that uh, Europe would have its own currency, as well as part of the reason to push aside the U.S. dollar, was actually predicted by Church of God writers no later than back in 1971, which, by the way, was over two decades before the euro was ever officially uh, agreed to. Now, as it turns out, those in Iran and some of the Arab nations, along with uh, nations such as Brazil, China, and India, have discussed plans for the removal of the dominance of the U.S. in global trade. The former and now current president of Brazil, uh, Lula da Silva, he even claimed that eliminating the United States dollar as the world's reserve currency status was actually one of the reasons that the BRICS alliance, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, was formed in the first place. They formed with the intent to push to not need to use the U.S. dollar for trade. And, uh, and by the way, others notice that's still an objective. And officially, the BRICS nations are currently working on setting up a new global reserve currency, which uh, looks like it might have gold backing. And by the way, the expansion of the BRICS nations from those uh, five I mentioned is in progress. There's like, like 11 or so who might also be part of this. And uh, another source says it will severely weaken the primacy of the U.S. dollar. And by the way, if BRICS expands, they also think it's going to hurt uh, Australian trade. I'm sure it won't help uh, Canada or New Zealand either, or the U.S. Despite the Bible warning against cheaping the money supply, uh, the U.S. has done so. And policies under the last several administrations, the Obama administration, Trump administration, Biden administration, have greatly accelerated this. And destruction is going to come. And we're starting to see the Federal Reserve raise interest rates. If they ever raise them high enough, uh, that will bankrupt the United States. If they went to the rates they were in like 81 and 82, uh, the U.S. won't be able to pay. It, 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 it will be really, really bad. Worse, worse than people can uh, think. And when the United States dollar loses its reserve status, it's going to be hurt. Now, the fact that they have the euro now, by the way, means that the European nations no longer had to use dollars to trade with each other. And the BRICS nations have been doing something along those lines. If enough nations dump the U.S. dollar, it's going to be a major problem. Inflation is going to hit the U.S. really hard, and eventually uh, we will be, uh, the U.S. economy will collapse. Does that mean I'm saying everything's going to be bad next week or next year? No. There's, there will be periods of temporary optimism. The U.S. has a wide diversity of agricultural, manufacturing, extraction, uh, tech industries, as do uh, as British Senate allies. And some things may temporarily uh, help the U.S. economy, etc. But as far as delays go, I'm going to read something from uh, uh, Daniel uh, 4, verse 27. Daniel 4, verse 27 says, uh, this is Daniel talking to the, to the king of Babylon. Let my advice be acceptable. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy on the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. So repentance could prolong prosperity, but the promotion of sin leads to destruction. And I'm not seeing any top U.S. leaders talking about uh, us repenting, nationally repenting, nor the British descended leaders doing as well. You know, the Bible talks about what leaders are supposed to be like. We look at the leaders of the uh, U.S. and its British allies. Ask yourself, you don't have to go there. We're going to read Exodus 18, verse 19. 
Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. Now you can't say that about the last uh, two presidents. We will skip all the other ones prior to it. We'll just talk about the last two. They uh, both uh, have a very clear documented history of uh, lying. Uh, and uh, they don't hate covetousness, and I won't go into it with both of them, but anyway. And in Second Samuel 23, verse 3, it says, He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And that's not the case of uh, what we see in the United States or uh, its British-descended allies. Uh, let's go to... Uh, Isaiah chapter 30. The Bible warns about the type of uh, moral decline that uh, is occurring in uh, the U.S. as British descended allies. Isaiah 30, start in verse 12. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word, means despise the Bible. Yes, people, this one's not at our website free online, just a, a copyright sound by uh, Nelson. But anyway, if you talk about the Bible, he despise this word and trust in oppression and perversity and rely on them. They think they're loving when they promote perversion and, and oppress those who stand up for the Bible. Therefore shall iniquity be to you like a breach ready to fall of bulbs in a high wall whose breaking comes suddenly in an instant. Now, how can this happen to the U.S. and its British descended allies? Well, I think a lot of things will tie it together, but let's go a chapter up to Isaiah 29, verse 5. Moreover, the multitude of your foes shall be like fine dust, and a multitude of the terrible ones like chaff that passes away. Yes, it shall be in an instant, suddenly. You will be punished by the Lord of hosts with thunder and earthquakes and great noise, with storm and tempest, the flames of devouring fire. So we see here, we're talking about something that's going to happen. It's going to be unexpected. Okay, uh, most people will not expect it to happen, and it'll be so. By the time it does, it'll be too late. For example, for the Laodiceans to to do most of them to do what they should have done. Anyway, the debt situation in the United States is putting itself at risk to not be able to recover if it's hit by uh, weather problems like. Uh, um, Hurricane Katrina or something like that again or uh, Yellowstone blowing up or something along those lines terrorist acts, war, riots, solar flares earthquakes, civil unrest the devastation of its genetically modified food supplies food shortages, various pestilences and other sorrows Jesus talked about furthermore political issues climate change, trade policies communication deals and other events are pushing to the United States a point it's going to be Take it over someday. The Bible warns that God will hurl disasters against some descended from Israel who provoke God. Those scriptures are mentioned in here. You know, particularly if there's something like an electronic, electromagnetic pulse attack, a severe solar storm, dusting hurricanes, etc. This would be a perfect storm, if you want to call it that, to set up the U.S. for destruction. I mentioned Yellowstone. I want to read somebody's assessment of Yellowstone. This is Dr. Michio Kaku. Scientists assure us that one assure us that one day the absolute massive Yellowstone supervolcano will once again experience a Category Eight eruption. If it happened today, it would literally tear the guts out of the United States of America. Instead of having 50 states in the union, we'd have 30 states in the union. Now, even if something happens lesser than that at Yellowstone or the Cascade Mountains, or elsewhere in the world, this could have devastating consequences. A perfect storm of disasters, internal strife, and misplaced confidence uh, will make the United States a nation that will be defeated. Uh, and without the United States, its British descended allies like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK, uh, they won't be able to fend things off. The Anglo-American order, which has dominated the world the last couple centuries or so, is coming to an end. Many sorrows uh, 
will be faced by uh, the U.S. and its British Senate allies, including weather problems. And the political leaders of the land seem to want to hasten the day by promoting uh, immorality. Anyway, just to summarize, it starts at the beginning saying that God made promises, promises that the throne of David would continue. He even mentions one, of, one or more of them in the book of Jeremiah when there was the last king. I think that's to give us a hint that yes, Jeremiah was the one who brought one of the queen's, king's daughters over to Northern Ireland. Ezekiel prophesied crown would be taken and the, the one on high, which had been again, the last king, Zedekiah, would be brought low in a low high. And the low was uh, King Haramon, who was the husband of Tiatefi, who was the queen uh, daughter of the, the king. Now, there would have been a queen too, but I don't know the queen's name. <laughs> Okay. And I went through a listing, showed when the overturnings happened. So God's word has come to pass. We went over the territorial expansion of the British Empire, which made it the largest land empire the world's ever seen. We went over prophecies that point to certain things happened to Manasseh, which is prophetically called Samaria. And these things are going to come to the United States. Uh, you can rely on the word of God. What God said will come to pass. Uh, for more on other prophecies in this series, I recommend you uh, check out our free online book, Lost Tribes, available at ccg.org. Till next time, this is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.